our sun, giver of all energy and provider of sustainable life here on Earth. And yet, in all of the sun's majestic brilliance lurks a darker side. Its boiling surface turns a 10,000 degree plasma entwined within a complicated magnetic field structure. Solar flares are constantly unleashing high energy radiation throughout our solar system. And solar eruptions unleash billions of tons of charged particles and strike whatever objects may be in their way. In this video, I want to highlight how strong these solar events can actually be, why they happen in the first place, and how prepared our internet infrastructure is for handling a major solar event. The results are quite surprising. It's yet another impact from this active solar cycle. A massive solar flare erupted on the sun yesterday. In the headlines, you may have noticed an uptick in the number of solar flare stories over the last few months. This is no coincidence. And as we enter towards solar maximum of the current sun cycle, more of these events are likely to unfold. I'll be covering what all of this means in this video. And by the end, you'll have a better understanding and perhaps a different outlook on our all too familiar neighbor, the sun. And hopefully you'll see this video before. Apologies for this interruption, but we have some breaking news. Around midnight on September 2nd, 1859, an aurora borealis swept across most of the northern hemisphere and into parts of Cuba, Hawaii, and Colombia. The main communication network at the time was telegraph, and the system was in chaos. The major world capitals had to shut down all business transactions conducted over telegraphic exchange networks. Operators reported electrocutions, ignition of telegraph paper, and telegraph transmission towers were sparking. One telegraph operator reported, During the auroral display, I was calling Richmond. Happening to lean towards the sounder, which is against the wall, my forehead grazed a ground wire. Immediately, I received a very severe electric shock. A fellow operator said he saw a spark of fire jump from my forehead to my shoulder. Virtually all telegraph systems over Europe and North America failed. On the morning of September 1st, the day before the ensuing chaos, an amateur British astronomer by the name of Richard Carrington was observing the sun's dark spots with a telescope. He had been sketching some particularly large sunspots when, as he describes, two patches of intensely bright and white light erupted from the sunspots. The fireballs vanished five minutes later, but by nightfall, some 17 hours later, this so termed Carrington event would collide with Earth and strike it with the equivalent energy of 10 billion nuclear bombs. The world witnessed its first major solar event during the modern age. A research study published in 2013 by Lloyds of London and the Atmospheric and Environmental Research in the US used data from this 1859 solar flare to estimate what impacts a Carrington level event would have on our modern society. Their findings were not entirely optimistic. They estimated in the United States alone long-term power outages would occur for around 20 to 40 million people and could last for periods of up to one to two years. This would also incur significant economic impacts, estimated in today's dollars anywhere between 800 billion to 3.44 trillion. So what produces these solar events and what are we doing about it? To understand this, we need to know a little bit more about our sun and more details on those dark spots Carrington was observing so many years ago. Before making this video, I wasn't fully aware of how sunspots were connected to solar events myself, but I found knowing a bit of context about the sun really helps. I hope you'll agree, and here are some of the highlights. Our sun is a dynamically rotating ball of plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter, that is, not a solid, liquid, or gas. Essentially, plasma forms when the thermal energy is so hot the electrons and protons aren't bound together as atoms, like they are here on Earth. So the particles making up the plasma are free electrical charges, either positive or negative. These charged particles are constantly moving on our sun, and because they lack rigidity, the sun rotates faster along its equator 
than at its poles. This differential rotation causes the sun's magnetic field to become increasingly wound up as the sun rotates. To understand this, you can think of magnetic field lines as invisible rubber bands of various sizes stretching around the sun. When the field lines are larger than the sun, they protrude out in space and rotate along with the top and bottom portions of the sun. This gives the sun its north and south poles, highlighted here in purple and green. But some of these magnetic field lines run within the sun. These field lines are less mobile due to the moving charges of the plasma, which essentially pin the field lines in place. But because of the sun's faster moving equator, this causes the field lines to become stretched and distorted. And like spinning a rubber band held in place, these field lines will twist and kink over time. Each kink that emerges from the sun's surface produces a pair of sunspots, one with the field pointing out and one with the field pointing in, a localized north and south pole, if you will. Notice, each line connects two sunspots together. This implies each sunspot contains a relatively large localized magnetic field. These magnetic fields inhibit the plasma within the sun's interior from reaching the sun's surface, causing these areas to be relatively cooler and appear as a spot to the naked eye. Sunspots have been tracked and routinely observed by astronomers since the early 17th century, but their connection to the sun's magnetic field wasn't made clear until 1908. One interesting observation with this sunspot track record is that their numbers ebb and flow in a periodic manner over time. During each of these periodic cycles, the number of sunspots will rise to some maximum value and then fall to some minimum value. Today, this is what we refer to as the solar maximum and the solar minimum. The time period between each of these peaks is around 11 years. So what is going on here? In 1959, it was discovered that the sun's primary north and south poles periodically flip in polarity, or the north pole becomes the south pole and vice versa. This flip was found to occur just after the sun reached a solar maximum. We can understand this phenomenon from the magnetic field perspective. Essentially, the magnetic field of the sun becomes so tangled up over time, it becomes energetically more favorable for the poles to flip. For reference, here's how the sun's magnetic field looks just after reaching the solar minimum around early 2011. The field lines look almost like a perfect bar magnet. But fast forward in time, and the field lines gradually become more stretched and distorted. And then around mid-2014, it reaches its solar maximum. And you can see how the purple and green field lines have begun to trade places. Now, if you did the math, you'd notice 2014 was around 10 years ago. So you would expect that the next solar maximum is fast approaching, sometime in 2025. Initially, this was the original projection of astronomers. However, current sunspot numbers are overshooting their original projections, meaning either an earlier date for solar maximum sometime this year, or an especially high number of sunspots during a 2025 solar maximum. Only time will tell, but 2024 has already experienced a fair number of solar events in the last couple of months. I've put a link in the description to NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center if you'd like to take a look for yourself. So what's so bad about sunspots and regions of intense magnetic fields? In isolation, sunspots aren't too much to worry about, but the dynamically rotating plasma of the sun makes isolation of these spots far from the norm. Remember I mentioned each sunspot is associated with either a north or a south pole. And like two bar magnets of opposite poles, these poles attract each other when brought in close enough proximity. In the bar magnet example, notice how the two bar magnets move towards each other when released. From a physics perspective, two magnets of opposite poles have a lower potential energy when brought together than when they're apart. By bringing them together, this lowers the potential energy of the two magnet system, which then gets converted into kinetic energy as you can see when the two bar magnets move towards each other. A somewhat analogous process occurs when two sunspots of opposite polarity collide, albeit a bit more complicated. As two sunspots of opposite polarity approach each other, their magnetic fields have to reconfigure at the boundary, in a process referred to as magnetic reconnection. The simulation graphic released by NASA shows a top-down view of two sunspots of opposite polarity merging together. The boundary region between the two spots is the golden X region, where the magnetic reconnection occurs. 
As surrounding charged particles in the plasma move towards this region, they acquire enormous kinetic energy and are rapidly ejected in a plane perpendicular in the connection region. In the very least, this rapid acceleration of charged particles produces high energy radiation in the form of x-rays. This is what we know as a solar flare. It takes around eight minutes for this light to reach Earth and immediately begins ionizing the lower levels of Earth's ionosphere. In standard conditions, the upper layers of the ionosphere facilitate high-frequency radio wave communication by refracting and then reflecting the waves back towards Earth. When solar flares ionize the lower, more dense regions of the ionosphere, this produces free electrons. These free electrons absorb high-frequency radio wave signals, which results in a radio blackout, relied upon by government agencies, satellites, and avionic communication. On February 22nd of this year, a trio of three solar flares wiped out radio communications over a large swath of Africa, the Middle East, India, Indochina, and Western Australia. These three flares were rated as X-class flares, with the third one rated at an X6. Like the Richter scale, solar flares are categorized on a logarithmic scale according to their strength, which is based on their X-ray emissions. The levels are A, B, C, M, and X with each classification level being 10 times stronger than the previous. So an X-class flare is 10 times stronger than an M-class and 10,000 times stronger than an A-class flare. And within each letter class, there's a finer scale from one to nine. It's worth noting that there's no upper bound on this classification scale. So solar flares can be much more powerful than an X-9. For instance, the solar flare that struck Earth during the Carrington event in 1859 is estimated to be an X-45 solar flare. We do have satellites monitoring the sun, such as the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellites, or GOES. But many of these satellites orbit Earth within the ionosphere. And as you can see here with this X-5 class flare back in December, their onboard electronics are greatly affected by the ionizing radiation produced by these events. Unfortunately, this isn't the end of it. Oftentimes, solar flares are accompanied by a much more pernicious event known as a coronal mass ejection, or CME for short. When two sunspots of opposite polarity collide, the kinetic energy gained by the ions during the magnetic reconnection often ejects some of these particles off the surface of the sun. Here's a side view of that same sunspot collision from earlier. Notice, during the reconnection, part of the sun's plasma is ejected off the surface of the sun and spun out in space. These ions clock speeds of up to 7 million miles per hour and strike any objects in their path. Back in 2012, a Carrington-sized CME explosion narrowly missed Earth by only nine days, based on the sun's 27-day rotation period. If the Earth so happens to be in their path, it would take the particles around 14 to 17 hours to make the 93 million mile journey before wreaking havoc on Earth's magnetic field or magnetosphere. You see, any moving charged particle produces a magnetic field. And when these high-speed ionic particles encounter Earth, their magnetic field interacts with Earth's magnetic field. In fact, they cause the Earth's magnetic field to undergo a magnetic reconnection of its own. And while this animation looks innocent enough, a real-time simulation of a Carrington-level reconnection would look something more like this. Just like the surface of the sun, a magnetic reconnection causes any surrounding charged particles to accelerate. So the charged particles within Earth's ionosphere are accelerated by these magnetic reconnections. Their accelerations are evident by the light they emit, which we refer to as auroras, or the northern lights. While pretty from the ground, these lights are actually indicative of geomagnetic storms happening within Earth's ionosphere which is why they are actively monitored by NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center. And as accounts from 1859 suggest, these auroras can extend virtually around the entire globe. Aside from an amazing light display, the magnetic field reconnections from a CME would also induce massive electrical currents in our ever-connected power grid. From introductory physics, you may remember Faraday's Law of Induction which states that a changing magnetic field through a closed loop of wire will induce a current through the wire. The amount of current induced depends on the strength of the magnetic field and how fast it changes. In this light, the magnetic variations produced by CMEs can induce enormous currents, 
as high as 100 to 130 amps. These currents can surge through the conducting areas of Earth's surface. The aspect of the power grid that becomes especially vulnerable in this scenario is the ground wire. Virtually every aspect of the power grid, from power substations to transmission lines, are grounded to Earth. Earth ground normally acts as a safety mechanism for when transmission lines become overloaded with current. However, during a CME, these wires become pickup wires for geomagnetically induced currents. And the high currents can destroy all ground-based electrical equipment connected to them. If you remember the telegraph operator's account during the Carrington event, he cited getting shocked by the ground wire, which grazed his face. And in more recent memory, during March of 1989, an X-15 class solar flare was accompanied by a CME that completely shut down Quebec's hydroelectric power grid. In the aftermath, Quebec spent billions of dollars in upgrades for mitigating the impact of a future event. One component of modern society that has yet to be sufficiently stress-tested during a major CME event is our internet infrastructure. 99% of all of the world's servers and data centers use an intercontinental fiber optic network that lies along the ocean floor. These millions of miles of fiber lines are responsible for keeping the internet global, and compromising these lines would essentially take it down. You might be tempted to think, how can an induced current affect fiber optic cables? After all, fiber optic lines are made of glass, an electrical insulator, and they transmit light signals. Unfortunately, for the long oceanic fiber lines, these light signals weaken as they travel through the fiber line and begin to attenuate as they travel. To strengthen the signal, optical amplifiers known as repeaters are periodically placed at regular intervals along the fiber, which amplify the signals and compensate for the attenuation. These repeaters require electric current to operate, and the current that powers these devices is carried by a layer of copper cladding that surrounds each fiber. From a side view, it's quite obvious each cable network makes a closed conducting loop susceptible to induced currents. It's also worth noting that the repeaters are designed to operate at around one amp of power, which is a hundred times less than potential currents induced by strong geomagnetic storms. These oceanic cables take two to three years to construct, and hence the destruction of multiple cables at once would be quite catastrophic. In light of the upcoming solar maximum, a group from Google released a study in 2022 analyzing the effect of geomagnetically induced currents on several of the existing fiber network lines in use today. Now, I found several poor assumptions made in this study, which I'll get to in a minute, but let me first lay the groundwork and some of the safety mechanisms they already have in place. They document that each fiber line is powered by two PFEs, or power feeding equipment. Each of these PFEs operate at just below half of their maximum operating voltage. For instance, the transatlantic fiber line operates with a total system voltage of around 11,000 volts. So under normal operating conditions, each PFE delivers around 5,500 volts to power the line. But each PFE is capable of delivering 12,000 volts. In this way, in case one PFE fails, the other can ramp up its voltage to 11,000 volts to compensate. This leaves around 1,000 volts of margin, which can be used to adjust the line voltage in response to environmental and physical changes, such as geomagnetic storms. For instance, if a solar event generates a line voltage of negative 200 volts, a PFE can ramp up to plus 200 volts in order to compensate for the induced voltage. The study then analyzes the voltage readouts from four oceanic cables during one month time periods in 2017 and 2021. The time periods analyzed contain mild solar events, which did in fact induce voltages on the fiber networks. The study then correlates any induced voltages on the lines with the strength of the magnetic field disturbance caused by the event. On their plot, the horizontal axis is essentially the strength of the magnetic field disturbance caused by the solar event, and the vertical axis is the strength of the induced voltage as measured on the cables. The data surveyed in their study falls in the lower left of the plot, and they have one data point from the only existing fiber line in operation during the 1989 solar storm, which induced a line voltage of 300 volts. Remember, this is the event that shut down Quebec's hydroelectric power grid and came after an X-15 solar flare. 
They also mark an estimate for the voltage induction resulting from a Carrington-like event. The headroom of the transatlantic fiber line is marked at 6,000 volts, which is what they claim the system can handle during any voltage inductions. If you take this chart at face value, you might conclude, as the authors of the study did, that the fiber system is in good shape and will not be damaged during a solar superstorm, even one as large as the 1859 Carrington event. But this conclusion might be more of a rose-colored picture than the real scenario. First, the 6,000 volt transatlantic headroom is only accurate if both PFEs are fully operational during the entire geomagnetic solar storm. If you learn one thing from this video, you should know these events are hardly localized, and power disruptions can span over entire regions and countries. If only one of these PFEs fails due to a power grid disruption, this brings the transatlantic headroom down to 1000 volts, since the operational PFE must then compensate for the downed PFE. Obviously, if both PFEs fail, the headroom goes to zero and the entire cable fails. So if the headroom goes down to 1000 volts in the case of a PFE failure, you may think, well, this still clears the Carrington-like event, as labeled by their chart. But the placement of the Carrington-like event is only a guess. Its placement on the chart at around 600 volts only assumes it would induce a voltage twice as large as the March 1989 storm. Now, there are many studies that attempt to simulate the voltage inductions from a Carrington-like event, and the answers remain speculative at best. But even the data on this chart may provide some clues. In the study's datasets collected from the Atlantic and Pacific fiber lines, the strongest induced voltage was produced by a CME associated with an X9 solar flare, which induced a voltage of 11 volts on the Pacific East-West line. The March 1989 storm induced a voltage of 300 volts and was associated with an X15 solar flare. Remember, the Carrington event was an X45 solar event, so a simple linear extrapolation of these two data points would place a voltage induction from an X45 class solar flare to at least 1700 volts, which is above the threshold if only one PFE fails. To be fair, the study does make a casual remark at the end of their paper that the primary risk to internet infrastructure resulting from large CME events lies in their impact on terrestrial power grids. But this detail seems to be lost in Google's own presentation of this study. It remarks, you can safely enjoy the Northern Lights without worrying that they'll take out the internet. I'm sure the designers of the Titanic said a similar thing about icebergs. Perhaps the most egregious detail this Google study seems to assume is that the 1859 Carrington event is the absolute worst possible solar storm our sun can produce. Earth's pre-industrial age historical record suggests otherwise. In 2012, a paper was published in Nature by Japanese physicist Fusa Miyake. In her work, she was studying the presence of carbon-14 in ancient tree rings. For some context, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope produced when high-speed particles ejected from our sun strike nitrogen in Earth's upper atmosphere. Under normal conditions, the levels of this carbon-14 in our atmosphere is fairly constant over time. Part of this carbon is absorbed by trees during photosynthesis, and the half-life of this radioactive isotope is what's used for carbon dating ancient objects. But this study wasn't about carbon dating. What Miyake found in these tree ring samples was a significant spike in carbon-14 concentrations from 774 to 775 AD. The spike was 20 times larger than any typical changes of carbon-14 during a normal solar cycle. This increase was also corroborated with a spike in beryllium-10 levels within ice core samples, dated to the same time period. Beryllium-10 is another radioactive isotope produced by high-speed solar particles. Subsequent studies found the same carbon-14 tree ring signature from Germany, Russia, the United States, Finland, and even New Zealand. Scientists believe this so-termed Miyake event was around 80 times more powerful than the Carrington event. Since 2012, scientists have independently confirmed at least five such events throughout Earth's ancient history, and a recent finding in 2023 suggests an event in the year 14,300 BC was twice as strong as the original Miyake event. Another clue to the potential power of a superflare is from our nearby star neighbors. Like the Sun, almost all stars are capable of producing flare events. And if the Sun behaves anything like our star neighbors, we may be in for a rude awakening. 
Here's one chilling account from astronomer Rachel Austin, recounting a super flare observed in 2014 from one of our sun's neighboring stars. When I got the news on April 23rd, earlier this year, that a flare had been detected by SWIFT and it was coming from a nearby flare star called DGCBN, I was initially uh, very surprised. SWIFT doesn't normally detect flares from nearby flare stars, and DGCVN is a relatively unknown star. It's a dim little red star. It has a luminosity that's about one thousandth the luminosity of the sun. It has a mass that's about one third the mass of the sun, and a radius that's about one third the radius of the sun. We can estimate how big the flare on DGCVN was with respect to the solar scale. It would have been an X 100,000. So this is several orders of magnitude larger than the biggest solar flare we've ever seen. It's tough to know what the upper limits of our sun really are. And unfortunately, solar mass ejections are quite unpredictable. While we do have several satellites constantly monitoring the sun's activities, we still only have a few hours of warning between when a solar mass ejection occurs and when it strikes us here on Earth. As the sun approaches its solar maximum, the probability of sunspot collision is heightened, so you may be noticing more disruptive solar events over the next year or two. Our collective thoughts on this issue shouldn't be if one of these events occurs, but when one of these events occurs, and how well prepared we will be able to handle the situation. Currently, we still have a lot of work to do, and it's a grave mistake to simply believe it should all be fine. I primarily wanted to bring awareness of these solar events and their potential impacts here on Earth. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider sharing with others. And there are quite a few topics in here that could deserve separate videos in their own right, so let me know in the comments if there are any specific topics you'd like me to cover further. And if you want to catch my future videos, make sure to subscribe to my channel. I'm Dr. John, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.